Uh, first of all, uh, welcome everyone here from uh, the Netherlands on a hot uh, summer day here. Uh, I'm sitting together with uh, Chris Joke. Uh, I'm Chris Twist, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, automating uh, APIs. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, well, first we're going to introduce ourselves, uh, then I'm going to give a small rant about why you should care about APIs. Then uh, Chris Jeuk is going to talk about what is an API, basic API examples, translating an API to PowerShell, performing tasks with APIs, searching for APIs, uh, will be done by me, yes, and then I will also do creating your own APIs, testing APIs, and integrating APIs, and we have a part about the community. So we have a lot of information to share in 40 minutes, so we will talk at uh, LTO speed. Or Sean Bass speed. Or Sean Bass, yeah. Uh, so first off, let me introduce myself. Uh, this is me. I work as a technology officer at RawWorks. Our mission at RawWorks is uh, creating intelligent uh, workspaces, um, uh, trying to make uh, big company processes 10 times more efficient with automation. And our main goal is uh, trying to make uh, you a user uh, work 80% of the time in one application without opening extra applications. And in that mission, uh, APIs are really, really, really important. So that's why we are uh, so th that's one of the reasons I'm also giving this presentation together with Chris. Hey, that, good, that guy looks like me. Uh, my name is Chris Joke. Uh, I'm a consultant for Conocenza in the Netherlands, and my day-to-day -day work is basically designing new uh, virtual desktop environments and setting them up, maintaining them, etc. And uh, I like to use automation, but only where it's beneficial. Don't automate everything and automate just where uh, where it's beneficial, like I said. Yeah, so uh, a, a, uh, a small rant from me. Uh, why should you care about APIs? In this, uh, in the E2EPC digital, I, I noticed that a lot of people are talking, of course, about uh, Windows virtual desktops, or they're talking about Citrix Synapse and desktop. Um, and as you can see, I also did a poll from yeah, what, what is the future digital workspace? Well, still a lot of people think it's it's going to be a virtual desktop, it's a modern workplace. Uh, and a lot of people uh, are still not really knowing how to read APIs and integrating them into a digital workspace. So why is this important? Well, you must understand, at least from my vision, my perspective, uh, Things like Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop are just a tool. They're a tool to uh, create a way that legacy applications can be used uh, anywhere by, 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 by the people. Um, because they can be used as a published application. But it's not the best user experience. The best user experience is not having to start up all those legacy applications at all. The best user experience is just sign into one web portal and from there do all your work. Uh, get notifications uh, just like on your phone uh, and, and uh, use application functions directly from that portal. I think that that is the future that we're going in and it's not only uh, I think that most of you guys have already probably heard of MicroApps of, of Citrix and Citrix is really doing this with the workspace and the future work. But it's not only a Citrix uh, mindset. It's also if you look at Microsoft with Teams, if you ever, most of you probably use Teams as collaboration or a video chat tool, but just for the fun of it, just click on apps in Teams and see how many apps there are already integrated in Teams. And you can even upload your own app and you can add your own logic app. So APIs are uh, part of that. Most applications, uh, especially SaaS applications, have an API which allows you to put that functionality in that Citrix workspace into uh, Microsoft Teams with that API. And if there is not an API, you can create your own API. And we're also going to show that during this presentation. 
So that is my small little rant why it's important because I really think that this is the future of work. Yeah, maybe this year, especially with COVID and stuff, it was the year of Windows Virtual Desktop. Everyone was bursting really fast to the cloud. But over five years, it will be the year of the intelligent workplace and everyone will start using that. So prepare yourself now for what's coming in the future. You don't want to be the guy that is still stuck on uh, on just maintaining old systems. So that's my rant. I'm going to give it over to Chris Jörg. He is going to talk about the first few uh, subjects. Yeah. Well, let me add, let me add, let me add to that. Uh, it's not about the workspace. Workspace. It's not about the application. It's about the information in the application and how you can get to it. Uh, well, first, uh, what is an API? Uh, well. The abbreviation is Application Programming Interface. Uh, the pro pronunciation is all they get to, uh, but I'm going to stick to a, calling it API. Uh, two definitions. Uh, a set of rules that allows programs to develop software for a particular operating system without having to be completely familiar with that operating system. And the other one, a set of functions and procedures allowing the creation of applications that access the features or data of an operating system, application, or service. Personally, I like the second one better because it's, it defines better what you what you do with an API. It allows you to get to the information uh, from an application without actually using that application. Okay, uh, so I have an outline of three uh, API examples. Uh, two of them are documented. One isn't documented. Um, uh, we walk through, walk through them, uh, how they work, how you can use them, and then in the next chapter we'll look into it. Uh, how you can convert them to uh, PowerShell. How can you, can you get to that information from PowerShell? First, Merriam-Webster. Um, they have a, a developer site, dictionaryapi.com, and uh, you can basically uh, sign up for an API key. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment, what the API key is. Uh, everyone can uh, sign up for an API key. There are no specific requirements. They just want you to. Uh, sign up first. Why is that? Uh, because uh, they want to authenticate and see who is using their API. What if they didn't have an API key and every, everyone could talk to it? Then uh, basically you could write an application that sends uh, a request to it every every second or so, and you basically take up a lot of their resources for your own good. And they don't they basically don't don't want that in their environment. So uh, they require to register for an API key. Uh, just see this as a token to get to use the API. Well, kind of looks like this. Uh, don't worry uh, for everyone taking screenshots now. Uh, these keys are not correct. So uh, I changed something. So don't try to use them. And why should you? Because you can just sign up for your own. Uh, they pr provide you with two uh, keys, one for the dictionary and one for the source. Um, I basically used only the dictionary one in this example. So uh, then we look into uh, their documentation. Uh, so basically, this is just from their website. You see uh, JSON. We're, we're going to use a lot of JSON, and JSON is basically the markup language. How you how you uh, how the information you get from it is presented. So um, in the bottom line, in the response, that is information in JSON form. First, you see the request URL, and you see uh, a URL, and then you see uh, vol voluminous. Uh, that's the, the search string, and after that, you put your API key. Uh, created here an outline uh, which specified uh, how you should format the URL. So basically, I could change the, the search string to something else, uh, and I need to have my API key. If I would, if I would in insert this in my browser, I would just get an error because your API key is not a valid API key. So how does that look when you create a working string? Well, I've created this one. I replace follow voluminous for scripting and I add my own API key. So what now? What if you paste that into your browser? Well, again, it, it, it gives back this information. As you can see, there are some, you, you, you see basically the outline of the information you get, but it's not really readable. Uh, that's because it's JSON and 
uh, by default, uh, the, this on the Chrome browser, Chrome browser just uh, doesn't present it as JSON, it just presents it as, play, as plain text. So what I did, I installed an add-on into my Chrome browser and it creates it like this. Beautifier. Uh, no, it wasn't that actually. It was called something else. But no matter, uh, it's a lot more readable, but still not really what you expect it. It's not really, yeah, uh, nice, nice and formative for someone, for a user to read. So uh, that was one example. We're going to get back to that uh, in the PowerShell part. But first, I'm moving to the next example. Well, I could take some from application or, 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 or any other thing, but why not something that's fun? like Steam. Most people really know Steam. Uh, Steam is in a, a gaming platform uh, from Valve and you can use it to buy games, to play games, to interact with, with other players, etc. And they also have an API, which is documented. Uh, here also, you need to provide, for, for some functions, you need to provide an API key. You can uh, register for that API key, uh, just the same as in, Mar Mar uh, in Merriam-Webster. Um, well, there are some examples here. Uh, you can get your uh, user stats, you can use the information, etc. It's all pretty well documented. So let's take one from the documentation and uh, work that out. So what I did was uh, the global achievements for an app. Uh, so to give an example, uh, you see an along a URL and at the end you see game ID. Game ID is the number of the game. 440 is for Team Fortress. Uh, for some reason, Valve thinks everybody still likes Team Fortress. Uh, I think they should put their time into developing other games like Half-Life 3. Never gonna happen, man. No, it's never gonna happen. Uh, so I changed it a bit. Uh, oh, you see also at the end, uh, it says Format XML. But I would like to change it to JSON because uh, as you can see later in the PowerShell script, JSON is a bit easier to work with in my opinion. So I changed the game ID to 252950. Uh, that's the gaming ID for the game Rocket League. Oh, I thought that we're going to do a question. I thought that Chris was on. The, Did people, people let people guess? Let uh, people guess. Okay. No, Rocket League. Yeah, Rocket League. Um, you, you can just basically look up look up the game ID. It's not not really a, a, a search, uh, a way to search for the game ID, but you can just open the store page for that game and you see the game ID in the top uh, address bar. Uh, so I edit it, and what if I put this in the browser? What will it give back for information? Well, the achievements you can re receive for Rocket League. Uh, at the top is your first timer. That's at least that's that's when you make your first goal. So most people, you 90% of the players of Rocket League, have that achievement. Well, but that's just one game. Of course, uh, there's one other game that's. All the rage right now, everybody's playing, everybody's twittering, everybody is putting it on their virtual desktop with GPU. All very cool. And that, of course, is Command and Conquer. So I added the game ID and it gives me that big, uh, gives me back that information. Now you can use it, uh, this kind of information for your own website. Maybe you have a gaming website and want to give a, a small a feed of achievements in your, uh, in your sidebar. Uh, you can do that with that kind, this, this kind of URLs. Okay, uh, that was the second example. Then we move to a third one, which, which is not documented. And actually, it's a Dutch thing. It's uh, our off over here or waste management system of the town that I live in. Uh, basically, on their website, they uh, tell you, uh, based on where you live, uh, when, which kind of trash is being picked up. Uh, and uh, it's just a website. And on the back on the back end of it is a is a waste management application that is used by a couple of other towns as well. And uh, what some guys did, and me all, uh, I also, um, is look at the at the, the way the the website works, and uh, basically figure out how it gets that information. Well, I looked into it, and if you look at the, the source code of the website, basically it Asked for my postal code and my uh, the, the number of my house. So my postal code is 24002RB and my house number is 34. After that, it gives this uh, this response. Uh, well, now you all know where I live. So any 
hate mail or fan mail, you know where to send <laughs> mail. And uh, but the important thing about this is the top one, the bag ID. The bag ID is something like a route, a route that the, the garbage man will take to pick up your garbage. So if I move to the next part, there's a second URL I need to need to enter with the bag ID. And then it gives back the following response. You see uh, the first round circles in the page style, it's pa uh, paper being picked up. And the bottom circle is the date it will be picked up. So this is a, a bit older screenshot, but on 20, uh, the 20th of May, uh, they picked up paper, the, the paper at our house. Okay, um, that was the, the, the third, uh, third example. Um, how can we translate these three things to PowerShell? Uh, so basically, you want to create a script, and in the script, you need that information. Now, of course, there are similar, uh, a lot of ways to get that information and to use it for different kinds of purposes, but I have three basic scripts to get that information. Well, first, we saw in an earlier uh, screenshot, we saw this URL. Uh, it gave a response as to the definition of scripting. Actually, it gave three definitions of scripting. Well, how do I translate it to PowerShell? Well, it's simple. It's an evoke web request with the switch URI, with the URL, and that's it. When you don't uh, provide a method in uh, evoke web request, it just assumes it's a get method and not a post. So basically, when you do a web request, you have a get for getting information, you have a post for sending information. So that gives this as response. Still not kind of what you want. What you want is the content of it. So it gives a lot of information when you did it and, and what and the header's about and, and all, all that kind of stuff. But you basically just want the content because the only thing you want is the definition of definition of scripting. So let me clear that up a bit. So I do the info prep request, the URI, I grab the content from it and and convert it from JSON because what I, what I get back is JSON, but I want it to create it readable into PowerShell. So use the uh, use the command to convert from JSON. Well, this is a bit, this is a bit better. You see short def, and it gives two definitions. The third one didn't fit on the screen, but there is a third one. Um, well, that's one step, but not still not quite quite what we want. We'll take it a bit further. So I create a function, consult dictionary. It gives a parameter, just need one par one uh, parameter. Uh, that is your search string. And it will input that search thing into the URL and uh, grab the date and the definition from the result. And then I would get something like this. So you just have a, a function loaded, you type in consult dictionary, you type in what kind of uh, what your query is. Uh, again, I cho chose scripting, and then it will show the three results. Well, that's a lot more useful because I now just see the results from my function. And this is a way of using the Marion Webster API for stuff like this. Then to the second, uh, we go back to the achievements. Uh, again, for Rocket League, um, well, like before, uh, the URL, the info web request, I grab the content from it and I convert it from JSON. Well, you just get this. Well, we need to, just like XML, you need to go dig a bit deeper. You need to get achievements and uh, achievement percentages and achievements. So it looks like this. As you can see, I've added achievement percentage and achievements to this. And uh, oh, it will give this as a result. You see the same, uh, the same information as you saw before on the website, although no, it's in PowerShell. And you can use that for whatever your purposes. Now, uh, I don't think there's a really use case to do this in PowerShell. Uh, because usually when you're PowerShell, you're doing work-related stuff and Steam isn't really work-related. But to complete this example, here's the same, but for Command & Conquer Remastered. Uh, but for Steam, you can also get your user information. But while I was working on this, it wasn't the best example. Because, as you can see, at the end of the target URI, you see a long number. That's my player ID. And there's not really an easy way to get the player ID without just opening the console, looking at the player, check their profile page, and get the ID. Uh, so this A example, 
but it isn't it isn't searchable. I just can just search my name and get the Steam ID. It just work doesn't work like that. But in this sample, uh, you could create something like this. Just a pop up with my icon, with my nickname, when I was, was lo last logged on, when my profile was created, where I'm from, etc. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, result isn't just from those two lines. Uh, there's a longer script, but this is what you can get to uh, when you start using this kind of information if you'd like. Then back to the waste management. Uh, okay, the so function. Uh, just simple. Uh, just get me the, the trash pick updates for my uh, for my house for my postal code and put it at the end in an outgrid view. So it will give this result. But why did I choose this example? Um, basically, uh, because I use it every day, almost every day. Because in my home automation system, it looks like this. You see uh, trash. Uh, and it gives us three types of trash, uh, paper, a plastic, and uh, what do you call it? If they... Green. <laughs> green trash. Let's call it green trash. And uh, it looks this way in my home automation. So every time at six o'clock, uh, it gets the current date. What date is it today? Does it match one of the dates? Uh, if so, uh, format the message and send it as a notification to my phone. So wake up, when I wake up early in the morning at 11 o'clock, I look at my phone, I see the notification, I notice I'm, I'll notice that I'm too late, and as a bonus, I know which type of trash will be piling up in my house for the next two weeks. Yeah, and this is really about also what I was saying in the beginning, automating uh, processes with APIs, making processes more efficient. Yeah. So that's why I chose the example, because it was, it was an undocumented one, but it was a useful one. So performing tasks with APIs, uh, and we chose Citrus Cloud for an example because these are all uh, the three examples were all getting information. It wasn't doing anything basically, it was just getting information that you use for other purposes. Uh, but before, uh, well, you have the developer side, which is actually pretty good. Uh, it's pretty well documented uh, most of it. Uh, well, you don't see the entire website, but there are a lot of options you can look into, and. Um, well, I chose first virtual apps and desktop because most people uh, that are listening right now uh, are familiar with this one. Um, but one thing we noticed when we went back to this, we, we looked at this last year and we were still not quite there yet. There was a lot of information, but not everything was correct. But it seems they improved it at this button, Info API. Well, what is that? You click on it and it gives a nice list of, of things you need to uh, uh, insert. Well, here you only need to in input two things. You see four fields, but the uh, three of those are optional. Only an author authorization. Um, and of course, in the user's URL, you need to input your customer ID. Uh, and one thing they added was to generate here for the bearer token. Well, you probably have seen a lot of, a lot of applications how you get your bearer token. I'm not going to go, uh, going to go into that. I'll give you a link later where you can uh, get your bear token through PowerShell. Uh, but basically what we're doing here is import our client, the client secret, you get this information when you uh, add an API access in Citrus Cloud and it will give me back my bear token. Uh, hold off on the screenshot, this bear token doesn't work. As you can see, uh, I input my super secret customer ID in the URL because it uh, would be, wouldn't be correct to give me my, my own one. Uh, and you send it and gives back feedback. Basically, it shows my delivery rules. Of course, this list is a lot longer, but it didn't fit on the screen, but you get the ID. These are our delivery groups that are in our Citrus Cloud tenant. Well, how do you do that in Citrus Cloud? It's basically just the same as before. Uh, I input the, the, the URL, I add my bearer token as a header. Uh, here, I define a method get and I find the header and get the content convert some JSON and show me the items. Uh, but still, but still, yeah, that was only uh, uh, still getting information, was getting anything done. So how do we do something? Well, as you know, and you set up a new location, it's the E3, uh, you need a research location uh, where you configure your cloud connectors. So it looks like this, you enter your name, you just save and you have a research location. You need to define it when you install your cloud connector. Um, 
but it isn't really documented how you create this resource location from uh, through API. So in our last presentation, we figured out how that works, uh, and basically just this text it actually quite quite simple. So I give a name as a body in the header. I give my bearer token and the type of uh, the, the the format I'm sending it, and then uh, I do invoke web request. Although the difference is, I do a method post. That's mean I, I'm sending something, and it gives me a feedback. As you can see here, gives me the feedback that E2E EVC resource location is created, and I have an ID uh, for it, and I can use that ID in other for installing Cloud Connect, for example. And as you can see, it actually exists right now. So I finally did something with API instead of getting just getting information. Uh, just two quick notes before I hand it over to my buddy uh, next to me. Uh, get bear token uh, in the developer website. They give you two examples. What with one with a with a command, and uh, I didn't know what the other one was. And the second one is uh, Eltro's uh, article about uh, getting O data, and that's just basically he, he outlines it how you can do with the PowerShell in a also a pretty decent way. One thing to bear in mind uh, is. There are different APIs for cloud, and some want the bearer token formatted with uh, CWS out uh, bearer in front of it, and some just want bearer in front of it. Keep this in mind. If it doesn't work, maybe you need the other one. Okay, then it's over to my buddy, uh, Chris. Please. So I see that I have uh, just some uh, some time left. Uh, so now comes my part. So this will be uh, really fast talking. So one of the things I always got asked is, okay, so how do you find these APIs if they're not documented? So, so I'm going to, we're going to do a quick demo um, about that. Let me switch to Firefox. So here I'm in Citrix uh, Cloud, and if I go to my resource location and I click on, uh, so here I have resource locations in Firefox. You can open your uh, uh, web developer tools and then to go to the network tab and if I now create a resource location and I save it I can here see the post command it's doing so I got the post so this is the API it's launching I can even see my customer number here and here in the header I can even see my bearer token and in the uh, Anfrag tab, I can see the parameters in the JSON and how the JSON is formulated in the post. So this is a way to find out uh, undocumented APIs. So let me quick uh, go back. So let's turn it up to 11 APIs. So I'm going to show you a few slides, but then I'm just going to demo, demo, demo. So. Testing APIs, we do this with Postman. I'm going to show you this in my demo. Creating my own APIs, well, there are a few different ways of creating your own API, but I'm going to demo it with Azure Logic Apps. And then integrating an API. Well, as I said in the beginning, I think that the future of work is integrating APIs into the workspace. So I'm going to give you a demo of a, a micro app integration into Citrix workspace. And keep in mind that this can also be done in uh, like Teams or VMware Workspace ONE. So those were my slides. Uh, I'm going to show you guys one last slide, and then I'm just going to do a demo. The last slide is um, at my company, RawWorks, we have a word for creating an API, an application uh, then that yeah, taking an application and then scripting that whole application so that you can use it in an other way. We call this application as code and we created a Slack community. So please join the, uh, the Slack. Uh, here you can, uh, there are channels for logic apps, micro apps, mobile flows, uh, uh, flow, all that kind of stuff. So, and there are already a lot of people in the Slack. So, if you have questions about those things, we can answer them and we can help each other. And uh, we are planning to do more and more with this Slack. So, the Slack at the moment is really there are a lot of people in there, but there's not much content. And we are trying to change this. But please join if you find this kind of stuff informative. So, I'm going to quit the the PowerPoint right now, and we're just going to do demo, demo, demo. So 
Um, first off, let me show you how you can test an API. Well, for testing an API, we got a tool which is called Postman. And Postman is just a uh, Postman is just a web browser, but without the GUI. You can send a URL. Uh, and it talks back to you in the language that it that it has. Uh, so here I pasted in the URL that we found here in the resource location, uh, creating a resource location. And I created a header with a content type and a bearer token. And I created a body. And the body is uh, JSON. So I formatted a piece of JSON here. So now I'm going to send a, a JSON with the name uh, Postman test. So this means I want a resource location with the name Postman test. So if I'm going to send this, this uh, works as a normal web browser. It says my Barrett token is invalid. That's correct because the Barrett token I generated uh, while I filled this in is already old. So what I can do is just get this Barrett token, copy that into my postman and I can do a send and if everything is now correct I should not get an error I should get an ID and when you see this ID this is the ID of the resource location so if you want to do more scripts uh, and API you can get this ID and do more things with it like putting uh, a cloud connector in the resource location so if we now look in the browser I'm going to refresh this. I should also see a resource location that is created with Postman. So it's called Postman Test. So with Postman, you can easily figure out all your, uh, you can easily test all your parameters and uh, make a body and get the response, just like you could with a normal web browser, but then especially for APIs. Uh, Postman is even really strong. It can do automated testing and stuff, but that is maybe for another time. So the next part I wanted to show you guys is the following. So let's say I uh, have a PowerShell script. Oh, let me really quickly start up my VM, sign in to my VM. So I got a PowerShell script that gets all the users from my Active Directory and then export it to JSON. So it's a really easy script. It's just load the Active Directory module, ask me for my domain credentials, uh, get all the users, uh, and then select only the sum account names. I only want the account names, and then convert it to a JSON. Uh, why do I convert to a JSON? Because this PowerShell script is something I want to do with an API. So I want to create my own API from this PowerShell script. So you, this is a really uh, simple example, but you can, of course, understand that you can make a PowerShell script that gets data from an application or data from, it's completely different, but it's important that you output to JSON directly in the script. It makes your life a lot easier. So if I run this script, here you can see, uh, oh, let's run the entire script again. It will ask me for my user. Well, this is my lab, so it's just administrator, nice and easy, my password. And here I got all the users in my lab, there's some account names. I even created a, a second script, which does a post. Uh, so it does a get, but it needs a variable to be posted. In this case, a name, because I want more information about that one user. So here I have the post and you see, okay, so now I get more information about this one user, in this case, my own user. So this is the information I want to access throughout an API all over the world. I want, I want to access this information throughout the internet. So what I did was I created a, um, in Azure, you have Azure Automation. And this is a really, really strong tool. What it can do is it can it has a credential fault. So uh, during the get script that I did, you saw I had to type in my credentials. Well, here I just saved them in the credential fault. And then in the uh, runbook, 
I created a runbook called Demo Get. And here you can see, here is the same script, but now with the credential fault added. So it doesn't ask for credentials. So if I run this script, I can run this script on a hybrid worker. A hybrid worker is an agent that you can push on any machine, even on-prem or whatever, and it only needs access to the internet. So as long as it has access to the internet, you can perform tasks on there from Azure, which is awesome. It doesn't require a dispatcher or anything. It's just an agent and internet. So on-premise, Chris, that's my lab machine. I'm going to start this now. And in a few seconds, we will see an output. And this output will be the JSON that, that I got. Uh, in the meantime, while this is running, I will show you. Uh, I also created the post one. This is the same, but it asks for that same parameter name. So if I want to run this one, I have to enter the parameter and also can do it on my on-prem machine. So let's see the results of the last uh, run. Now, the demo get is still running. Sometimes Azure is slow. Ah, it's still, yeah, it's completed. So here I have the output. So this is already a JSON. So I can also see that the demo post should be, it's still cute. Okay, so it's coming. Sometimes Azure takes some time, but it always gets there. Well, this is great that I can now have those, the information from that machine. I have that in the internet. I have that this in Azure. But still, I have no way to uh, launch this task. Well, you have webhooks here, but you cannot really use them. Webhooks are just uh, a way that you can uh, start a task with a URL, but you don't get the output of the task back in that same URL. So it only gives you an output like, okay, I started the task successfully, great. It's not something that you need. What you want is the output. So we're going to take it a step, uh, step further. And here is where logic apps can come in. So here you can see the get. And what I just do is, is really, really, really easy. I created the logic app and this logic app says when a HTTP request uh, is received on this URL. So this URL is generated by the logic app with a method get start my uh, automation job, wait for the job to finish, get the output for the job, and then give a response with a job. So if I copy this URL, and I'm going to do that uh, in my postman, what I already told, this is a testing uh, suite, you can see that it will automatically show you, okay, these are the query parameters in your uh, logic app. And if I now press send, yeah, okay, so now it's running. Uh, what it is, uh, Logic App and this whole process takes uh, like 30 seconds, but you can see live in Azure what's happening. So I can go to overview, and if I do uh, refresh, I can see that it's running, and I can even see in which state it is. So it got my request uh, all right. It's now running that automation job. So it's waiting for the automation job to finish because I said wait for finish. And it will get the job output once it's done. Well, it's taking, usually it's 30 seconds, but it's taking a little bit longer. Maybe Azure is busy. Or if, and, or if you want to try and it right now. Yeah, and of course, I, uh, I choose to do a live demo. So, uh, so that's also always uh, great. But it's done. So just keep talking, just keep talking. Uh, and it also has now created the output and the response. So if I go back to Postman, here I have the same response. So this is the response of a PowerShell script that I get throughout the internet. So now we can do some cool stuff with uh, logic of, uh, with uh, micro apps. So from this logic app, I can create a micro app. I see that we don't have a lot of time left. So I'm gonna uh, quickly show you the micro app side of things and here in the micro app side i can create a custom integration and if i look in the custom integration i use the base url of my uh, logic app the data loading is the the workflow 
And here you can see that it does it get to this uh, machine. Here are my query parameters that you can see here in Postman, they're the same. You have to uh, remove those query parameters and put them here in the micrad. It's a whole thing, don't ask me why. It's... You can then test it and you can get it. So how does it look as an end user? Well, I'm just a normal end user. I don't have any uh, access to the Active Directory, but you know, Maybe I'm my HR employee and I need to see everyone that is in that Active Directory. Well, now it's simple. I just got one button here, get a day users, and here is the data, right from the workspace of the end user, without the end user having needing uh, to know PowerShell or to need to know how logic apps work. Uh, it's, it's really, really, really powerful. So, you can understand, so this is with a really small script, but if you have a really cool uh, script, you can of course do really great things. Or better yet, combine information from various sources and yeah. present it as one uh, from Minecraft. Yeah, so if you're also interested in this, uh, Citrix has done a uh, hackathon recently, Converged, and we did a complete something like this, but we did it with self-service and onboarding. Also just running scripts through logic apps and then uh, creating a whole onboarding system for HR. I see that uh, our time is, I think, over, but there are questions. So please, yeah, if you have questions, uh, go. We will try and answer them. Uh, question for Chris. Is there a way to use task over multiple Azure tenants? Uh, yeah, you can create, uh, between your tenants, you can create trusts, uh, that's called, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, an enterprise trust or something, I think. Uh, but you could also just, um, create, um, uh, different logic apps in different, uh, yeah, there, there's also a thing called API manager. Check, check that out. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rasmus, All right. So 